Welcome back everyone. We're about two weeks into our trip and uh, as you saw from the intro we've been up to all sorts of shenanigans, hiking and swimming and exploring, having a really great time here in northwest Montana. But uh, the last four or five days has been really bad for solar for us. I don't think we're gonna have any power issues. Full lights. How's our battery doing, sweetheart? I might have been uh, wrong. <laughs> We've been in the under the uh, forest canopy and rain and super cloudy, dark clouds for a few days there. So we were fairly discharged. So we're here on this little bit of a peninsula that sticks out from the lake a little bit where we've got lots of nice sun and we have all eight panels spread out, pulling in as much power as we can. And so I thought it'd be a great opportunity to give you guys a little bit of an update on our solar panels since we installed the, or upgraded from the four panels to eight panels this spring. And uh, kind of a real world, what you can expect from lithium and solar uh, after a year of fairly hard use give you my opinions on that. So on this trip, we've really been trying to use the system to its fullest potential, uh, not skimping on charging anything or avoiding using the battery just because we're trying to save battery power. We've been charging everything we want to charge, flying the drones as much as we want, keeping the laptop fully charged, surfing the web for fun, all that sort of stuff. It's been performing really well. So I thought I'd give you a little bit of a a rundown as to what you can expect from a similar setup and uh, also some of the little pitfalls or nuances about solar that you might not think about and certainly isn't advertised on marketing materials for solar panels. It seems some of this stuff isn't common knowledge and I learned it the hard way so I thought I'd put together a quick video of tips and pointers for you to consider if you're building or plan to build a solar powered rig such as this. Okay, so the first thing of course is solar. You need a lot of solar. But what a lot of people don't realize is that solar panels are rated in STC, or standard test conditions. And that means that they will take a panel they've made, uh, put it on a table in a cool air conditioned 22 degree room and flash a thousand watts per square meter at that panel and measure its output. And in most cases, it is what it should be, plus or minus 5%, call it a 185 watt panel, it makes 185 watts as they flash the light onto it, passes the test and it goes out the door. Now I understand the need to rate panels with a standard test and, and that's fine, I get it. But the problem with STC ratings is that they're not realistic to the real world. Solar panels efficiency drop dramatically as they heat up and they heat up dramatically when you put them in the sun. So it's a little bit of a catch 22. For example, we have 1.48 kilowatts of solar on our roof, but those are STC ratings. So in the real world, we're actually getting about 800, 900 watts peak, best case scenario. Now granted, those panels are flat on the roof and not uh, 90 degrees to the sun, but Realistically, most solar panels, you're going to get tops two thirds of their rated output. So that's certainly something to keep in mind if you're planning a solar setup on your bus or sprinter van. Another gripe I have with the solar industry are these new flexible solar panels. And while there may be a few outlying amazing quality flexible panels out there, a majority of them are gimmicky with plastic film on front and back that is not UV stable and that causes the panels to haze or turn milky within a, a year or two and then uh, that, that uh, membrane becomes very brittle and then any flex uh, of that panel will cause the cell on the inside to crack, hot spots and then the, the whole panel fails because the, the solar cells are wired in series. Any one cell failing causes the whole panel to go down. I'm not going to get into it too bad. There's a bunch of other downsides like heat. Typically they're installed directly on your roof of your van or RV and that transfers heat directly into your RV. Further, uh, there's no cooling on the back because it's laying directly against your uh, rooftop. There's a bunch of reasons I don't like them. I won't get into them. Ask me in the comments if you're really, really stuck on them, but and the next part of the puzzle, of course, is batteries. 
Now in an RV application or if you're converting a sprinter van to be a, a bit of a camper, it seems very tempting to put an extra lead acid battery in the back under the bed and just wire that into your engine's alternator, uh, you know, using a battery isolator or a charge control relay and just charge it off the engine when you're running and it disconnects from the engine when you're not running and everything's hunky-dory. You can run that battery flat and you can still start your vehicle. And while that's fine, it works fine, that's how it's been done for decades, the problem with that is when you scale up larger. It works fine if you're running just uh, you know a few reading lights, LED lights in the back and a small fan maybe and charging a cell phone or two. But if you've got heavy battery uh, needs, you know, power requirements, you want to run a, a uh, microwave, induction cooktop, charge four drones, three cameras, two laptops, etc. You need a lot more power and lead acid doesn't really scale super well in that regard. Uh, you know, for a system that big you need three to five hundred amp hours of reserve capacity and that's pretty big. That's three or four large lead acid batteries. Uh, it'll take you a long time to charge that off of your alternator. And if you're trying to charge lead acid batteries off of solar, there's even bigger disadvantages. The biggest one in my opinion being that a uh, lead acid battery is a fairly high resistance battery. And what that means in practical words is as you throw 500 watts at it, for example, it will resist 50% of that charge. It'll resist taking the charge and and radiate that 50% of the power that you're giving to it as heat, warming up the batteries. And uh, so when space is at a premium on an RV or van roof, you want to be able to absorb and reuse as much of that charge as you can. Now compare that to a lithium iron phosphate battery, it can absorb 96, I think, depends on the manufacturer and technologies. There's, there's many kinds of lithium batteries, lithium iron phosphate and cobalt and so on. But uh, in the high 90s percentage efficiency uh, when it comes to charging. So we have 1.48 kilowatts that put out about 800 watts and we're absorbing 750 of it at high noon, best case scenario, as opposed to 375 that you'd absorb into a lead acid situation. So that's a really big deal for, for me, that why it made so much sense to go with the lithium pack over uh, lead acid. Now, another downside for lead acid is uh, sag. Most of you have been in a cold weather situation where you try and start a car. You get in the car and you turn the key to the on position and all the lights are on, but they're kind of dim. You know, your dome light and so on, your dash lights are all dim, but they're glowing, I guess and then you flip it to start. You turn the key and try and start the car and all the lights go dim while it's starting. That's a symptom of the high resistance battery again. It can't put out the current because it's resisting putting out the current in the same way it was resisting taking it in in the first place. And so that high resistance uh, situation causes all the voltage just to drop dramatically while you're trying to pull a high current load off of it and that's called SAG. And Bill over at Colorado 4x4 channel there, he's kind of experiencing that now with his setup where he's got an inverter and a microwave or some other high current loads on a lead acid battery. And when you put that high current load on it, the voltage just tanks. And that's, that's a big downside, for many reasons. Uh, it's a lot harder on the electronics when the voltage goes down because then the current goes up and puts added stress on all kinds of things. But um, yeah. I'm not going to get into it too deep, but the moral of the story is lithium iron phosphate or lithium iron cobalt, so all the lithium batteries don't suffer from this problem. You can, uh, I can put a 2000 watt load on that battery and its voltage drops from 13.2 to 13.15, a negligible voltage drop uh, and essentially no sag. So. That's what I wanted to say about lithium. Uh, it's a big step. Uh, it seems like a big choice to make um, because they're so expensive. And that's often the criticism when people are specking out a new system or trying to retrofit something and put lithium in is the sticker shock of the 
with the price of the lithium pack, it seems very expensive. You know, it might be ours, for example. I'll use this as an example. We have uh, 360 amp hours of lithium at 12 volt, and we paid about 1,800 Canadian. It seems like an expensive battery, but when you consider that uh, a lithium battery has 3,000 80% depth of discharge cycles as compared to a, a flooded lead acid has 300 50% depth of discharge cycles uh, the the math works out in in lithium's favor tremendously and that's another good point for lithium is that you can discharge a lithium battery to 20% you can use 80% of the battery without adversely affecting the lifespan or or damaging the cell in any way and uh, a lead acid battery you can safely discharge to 50 percent before uh, further discharging will damage it somewhat. Uh, now I know many of you have likely been in a car left the headlights on and drained the battery flat flat and I, you know, I put a charger on it and charge it right up it works fine. It does it's true but you have affected the the long-term capacity of the battery. It won't hold as much capacity when you need it. Uh, for a high current load. We'll get into that. Look it up, trust me. Okay, so I'll wrap this up there. I didn't want to drag this on too long, but uh, I know there are some people building their systems right now that are kind of coming up on some of these problems here right away. So I wanted to get this out and I've been meaning to do it since spring. It's just kind of hard to be concise and get all this information into a video without being long and monotonous and boring. So. Hopefully you guys found something useful. If you did, please let me know, thumbs up below. Leave your questions in the comments and I might be able to throw together another video here uh, addressing all those questions more specifically. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you guys next time.